Great, well, I'll kick it off then. So I'm Zach Didding, uh, CEO and founder, and we are Hank. So we found that most buildings are horribly uncomfortable and terribly inefficient because there's no on-site engineers or technical resources to manage those buildings. We found the majority of buildings in the United States actually have a heavy third-party vendor reliance, and they actually use old antiquated software to try and manage buildings daily. When we break down this software and hardware systems that manage buildings today, they're arranged like a central nervous system in a human body. There's a brain or ethernet based front end, and it's supposed to manage the subsystems you see below. So it absorbs a bunch of data, and then it's programmed incorrectly most of the time in order to manage the systems. What we find is they're programmed so haphazardly, there's over 30 to 40% runoff less than six months post install. Even worse, this problem affects over 50% of all buildings in the United States. We found the biggest chunk of the commercial sector is affected and it's leading to a huge market opportunity to the first person that can figure out how to autonomously power buildings and manage the workflow. And that's what we've done with Hank. So Hank is an end-to-end -end AI virtual building engineer. Hank's gonna bolt onto that existing brain. He's gonna take control of those systems. He's gonna push that data up to the cloud and he uses machine learning to manage these buildings daily. And the results that we see are now staggering when we look at energy efficiency in buildings. Unlike the other manufacturers and people before us for the last 50 years that have spent their time managing hardware systems, Hank is truly software focused. We, we built over 90% of the OEM drivers required to attach ourselves to existing systems. And we're really leveraging an AI machine powered platform to be 95% more efficient than the existing third party providers in these buildings. When we break down our competition, it's really arranged into two categories. On one hand, we have software businesses providing read-only applications to end users. They provide suggestions in order to drive energy efficiency. On the flip side, we have natural old large hardware incumbents in the space like Siemens. They're providing large capital intensive projects to drive large capital gains. We find Hank right in the middle. So Hank uses software to drive as large or even larger gains than the existing incumbents. When we break down our target customers, we're really looking at owner managers. These are people that both own and manage their own office buildings right now. So they're financially incentivized to move forward with Hank. On the back end, we've actually been able to roll their contractors into a third party channel that we're starting to fire up. Doubling down on these owner managers, we found on average, they own about eight buildings, around 600,000 square feet, generating about 130,000 in ARR. And we find about a 90 day sales cycle as we start to penetrate this really antiquated industry. Scaling out two years from now, we're gonna to get to 3 million with only 400 buildings. We can achieve that just between here and the Bay Area. Extrapolating out to five years, we get to 100 million with almost 12,000 buildings. In cross comparison, some of those companies you saw on the previous slide were able to do 15,000 plus buildings by this mark, making it a very achievable, exciting goal for us. When we look at our background, we started Hank about three and a half years ago. Uh, we launched Hank. Um, we actually won a Calci grant. It gave us about an 18 month runway. Uh, we used that runway, we leveraged uh, other people in the industry, including Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and Taylor Engineering, so really big minds in our space. Uh, we had about 12 pilots that we ran on. We made sure we got it right. What we learned in commercial real estate is you have one shot with building owners to get it right. And if you do, you can start progressing throughout their portfolios. In 2019, we officially commercialized and launched and rebranded as Hank. We already have 12 buildings under our portfolio. We're continuing to grow that portfolio. And really exciting, we're able to bring on more people and start adding to our team. So our latest acquisition was Jeremy Spillman's heading up sales for us. We started to scale out now, and we've been able to leverage Blake and Tyler and turn them into really polished data scientists. I'm Zach Denning, and we are Hank. Well, the presentation uh, you gave recently was so interesting because when you looked at the incumbent systems, in 10 years, the, the, the tenants of the building had like completely sabotaged um, the installation because they weren't happy with the levels of comfort and, and lighting, et cetera, that, that were going on there. And just making the, those systems work um, and in ways that the tenants like, that's, you can really see the opportunity that, that's coming up there. So, uh, but it was just funny to see how many people um, so sabotaged their own for some building feedback. control systems. Um, would anyone like to go first? Um, so we're going to ask for some feedback. Not uh, from the panel. Sure would anyone randomly like to go first? Are you looking for feedback or a rock? Okay. Anyone <laughs> 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 people randomly. And, uh, there you go. 
put you on the spot. Jack? Pending Questions, uh, feedback. Talk a little bit more about the pilot projects and the customers that you have right now and how much hey, hit it up, you know, yeah. visibility you have to revenues um, yeah. in the next, let's just talk about the next year. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're already generating revenue. Uh, we we started out with unpaid pilots uh, over the course of the last three years. So the customers that we have today are all paid for customers. Um, we started strategically targeting uh, triple net tenants, tenant owned buildings were kind of where we started. We started to branch out now working with a couple of development groups locally and we've gotten to that owner manager group. That's the subset or the biggest subset of this market that we found that we're really trying to penetrate hard. Uh, today we have about 10, 12 buildings that we bring on a couple more this month under management and they're full paid customers. Uh, looking out, our goal right now is to hit around 30 to 40,000 MRR by about, April or May. We're going out for uh, intellectual a property. How, how difficult is this to copy, and, and and sort of where are you at with regard to creating a technological sustainable advantage? Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. So what we find ourselves. Uh, we're penetrating a really old, antiquated industry that hasn't changed in about 30 years. So what we find is uh, once we penetrate and we get in, it's really hard to get Hank out. So Hank's constantly learning, but we own the data, we own the hardware, and we own the software. We're actually not even leasing them a platform, we're leasing them a solution. So when customers buy into Hank, they're buying a solution, they're buying a result. They get a few dashboards and we do turn stuff over to them so they can view how their building's operating, but they're not actually buying anything. Um, so as a result, if the customer decides to cancel it, they lose both the comfort and the energy savings we've generated, and they go back to the original system before Hank started. So right now, some of our customers, that's a year, 18 months that they'd have to undo to get rid of us. So we think churn's going to be extremely low with the product. Um, as far as IP goes, we don't want to patent anything yet. Um, we're not divulging anything to customers that we'd have to patent anyways, so it gives us a huge technological advantage. And the other side of it too is we've created OEM drivers so we can bolt on. We're, we're more Android than we are Samsung. We can bolt on to any existing platform with, or bolt our platform onto any existing uh, hardware that's already in the space so we can scale out pretty quick. So kind of with all those things combined, we don't really feel the need to, to patent anything right now because we have pretty strong, you, uh, just kind of natural organic IP protection. Project, um, what, what was your go to market and in that process to speak to some of the barriers that you may have found in your filling out market yeah, that's yeah, a good question. Uh, it's an antiquated industry. Anybody that's ever penetrated an antiquated industry, very challenging. You got to find a niche. Uh, when we started, uh, first is identifying building size. So our building size, our, our sweet spot's around 50 to 75,000 square feet right now. Uh, we are starting to scale up and out of that market based on um, customer feedback, people actually coming to us now, we're getting to some larger buildings. But we started there and then we started researching who are the biggest uh, people in the space, like who's our targets gonna be, and we find, kind of found owner managers as being that ideal target. Uh, mostly the, the annual contract value, the ACV is fairly high, so we penetrate one building, they start putting us into more. We can do that more on the back end, uh, business development uh, managers rather than account managers to go penetrate. Most of it's been brute force outbound, so cold calling, uh, Jeremy can probably attest to it. Cold calling actually works better in this industry than emailing. What we found is nobody cold calls, everybody does emails. So when Jeremy calls out, he usually gets responses from C-level staff now. Uh, we've been able to penetrate a few of the local accounts by actually attacking their C-level, not the property managers or the asset managers, which has been a very interesting because everybody keeps telling us, oh, it has to be asset managers and property managers. We're actually finding out eventually we're, we get down to that level, but we don't have to start there. So very, very interesting, um, but you know, traditional 90-day sales cycle uh, till we get in the first building. Um, and then once we get in the first building, we're finding it's about three months to start progressing throughout the portfolio. Are you like sitting down with them? Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of it's been sit down. So when we got, I always tell the story, when we got our first building, uh, it was an owner-occupied building in Roseville, and they actually had an open suite. So one of the suites is open, and so we convinced the board to let us come in. And we actually put a sign on the door that said, hey, come talk to us, we want your feedback from all the tenants. And we posted up there for about two and a half months. And we literally let people come into the suite and tell us what they liked or didn't like about Hank. And they actually crafted the name. So originally we were Interdap, but it sounds like a CIA spinoff. So we kind of moved on. Uh, but we had people come by and say, hey, it's a virtual engineer, it needs a name. And it actually even helped pivot us in our naming and in our branding, which has been fantastic. So. Comfort. So a lot of cases it's comfort. Um, what we find is comfort gets us in the door. 
most people are uncomfortable in office buildings. I think they can attest to that. Maybe not downtown, the big high rises where you have five, six chief engineers or engineers working on your building might not be so bad, but the majority of a uh, mid-sized commercial comfort's an issue. But what we find is that uh, energy keeps us there. So they may like the comfort in the beginning, but it's not a staple point. They aren't gonna keep paying for a product every month because they're very, they're comfortable. They're gonna keep paying because it's actually, they see a reduction in their bills. So we kind of find that you can't have one without the other, um, but the, the holding point, the, the lack of churn is gonna be in the energy efficiency side. We got a question from the audience over here. That's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, they can change their space temperature set point. So if you like it at 72.5, Hank will keep it at 72.5 seasonally. So it's actually better comfort than your house. Uh, your house fluctuates two degrees up and down, Hank fluctuates one. So we actually have 100% better comfort than the household. That's usually the only setting you need to mess with. So what we find uh, a lot of people are in there messing with a lot of settings. In a typical 50,000 square foot office building, there's 300 settings or more that you can manage to keep the building comfortable and running efficiently. Hank manages like 280 of those autonomously. So we use true machine learning and applied machine learning, if you want to call it that, to actually manage those set points properly. So we usually, it's usually a hands-off. It's a lot of read-only, and what we tell clients is if you like it at 72.5, just set it there, and Hank will keep it there the most efficient way. You don't need to mess with it. Um, but as we get to more technical gatekeepers, that we find that they want to start getting a little bit more hands-on, and so we've opened up a little bit of control for them. But the most important part about the customer feedback has been telling them why it's working the way it is. So we've gotten extremely descriptive in the way we've told them through alarming and through uh, current actions Hank's taking and why he's making decisions. And what we found is they're willing to go more hands off now knowing but, so feedback, um, why he's uh, doing Wonderful presentation. I, you identified customer pain um, so and then up. came up with a solution. So, so well done on that. Um, question on kind of sustainability. Does this work or have you thought about getting this onto the lead scorecard? And is that actually going to help or is that going to hurt your cause? Yeah, I think long term it would help. Um, a lot of the things on lead scorecard are starting to bend more around HVAC design. Um, you know, and, and that's what we started initially when I looked at lead you know, three or four years ago, it was a little more broad. Where this is a little bit more specific, it might be a challenge. But now that it, that lead's starting to get more specific in some circumstances, I think it would start to apply. I think right now we're starting to see a lot of traction and success the way we're already doing our outbound. That you know eventually bringing somebody in that's lead certified that can start spooling up kind of that marketing angle. I think there's a, a good opportunity there. Um, but now just really with brute force outbound, that's our, our number one focus, especially with our target customer. We found as kind of the really the biggest pain you, point. We're kind of doubling down there right now with our, the, with our staff. Are there for you to go to other markets, like an even bigger market? I mean, are, what are, are there other limitations for you? There are not. So we find even bigger markets. Are there There are not. So what we find is that uh, the bigger the building, the bigger the portfolio, uh, the more technical stakeholders. And we're learning how to navigate technical stakeholders organically because we've called on those customers about their smaller buildings and they're trying to pull us into their bigger buildings now where those technical stakeholders live. So we're learning how to navigate those right now. We can always go up. Uh, right now we're in K through 12, uh, private commercial real estate, uh, junior colleges. Um, so we've already kind of branched outside of our initial vertical that we went after, which is commercially, you know, private owned mid-sized commercial office building. Um, so we can, uh, what we find is that the bigger the building, like buildings like this, for example, the value prop gets more diluted. Uh, there's many, many more companies around the smart building space that, that pollute this market. So it makes buying decisions really challenging for customers. You couple that to a technical stakeholder that's also reviewing the decision and you have a six month sales process or six month sales timeline. We found a way to short circuit that by going after small buildings. We also find that for us, small buildings actually generate more revenue over time, uh, building owners are willing to pay more and because they see more savings actually in smaller buildings uh, per square foot because the buildings don't work as well. So there's a couple of things that I think this market hasn't really been explored yet and we've taken the time to do it uh, that makes it very advantageous for us to get a head start. Yeah, have you lost any customers yet? You talk about how sticky this product is. Now, another question, Brian? Yeah, have you lost any customers yet? You talk about how sticky this hmm. product is. Now, so our initial customers are almost a year and a half in now, and we haven't lost them. Um, again, we own the data. Uh, we own Hank, we own the AI, we own the software, and we own the hardware. So the benefit to us is that there's, there's a very little amount of churn. So if our customers from a year and a half ago decided, hey, we don't want Hank anymore, 
Uh, one, they'd have to abandon $3,000 of savings on an $850 monthly charge, which is very challenging. Uh, two, all the comfort improvements that we made live in our system, not in the existing OEM. So they have to abandon all the comfort changes too. And whoever they replace this with, they have to pray that they can um, come up with the same, the same success uh, in a very short timeline. We did all that within 30 days. So we did 30 days of development uh, with that customer, customer integration, and we've only spent probably 10 to 12 hours with that customer since then. Uh, over a year and a half. So you have to hope that there's a replacement out there. So I think the, the big benefit for us is, you know, everybody always asks, well, Siemens and Johnson and Honeywell, why wouldn't they do this? Uh, their R&D budgets are less than 1% of their annual revenue, for starters. Uh, two, they buy companies like us. They don't try and model divisions after us. But more importantly, they can't even go back into buildings where we've landed our software on top. Um, they can't go back into those buildings and resell the customer on their own solution with their own hardware. It's because we've already advanced them beyond what the hardware was originally capable of. So it's very challenging for them to even repenetrate their own accounts. So. <laughs> one, one more question. Um, you said that you owned data. Heard, heard some questions, yeah. How would you commercialize your data? Not something we talk about too often, because uh, most people don't even know how valuable the data is yet. We do. Uh, so we've already been approached uh, doing these pitches around the Bay Area. We had a, a commercial banker come and approach us that works around real estate, and he said the data for Wall Street is extremely valuable. So what, we, what we've already been able to do uh, for fun was we already been able to correlate data to occupancy in buildings. It's the number one sought after point from people like CoStar, uh, Reonomy. The one data point they can't get is occupancy. And it's the number one data point that affects commercial real estate market and prices. Uh, occupancy is the majority of a building's value. We have that data on tap uh, because we control the HVAC and that tells us who's in there and who's not. Um, so it is something long term that we would look at as a potential play. We know, I mean, ultimately there's a lot of angles we can go, but right now it's just getting to as many buildings as possible. So. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.